Hey guys, so today I wanted to cover the material for analysis in chapter 15 of The Dressmaker, and again, we'll be centering our analysis on how it can be compared with The Crucible. Okay, so first things first, let's do a summary of chapter 15. The Beaumonts return from Melbourne, and we see the dynamic in their family shift yet again because Gertrude is pregnant. Um, Leslie Monken is introduced here in this chapter, and we see Septimus and Hamish brawl in a bar. Other than that, it's quite an uneventful chapter. So, on chapter 15, we start with the people of Dungatar kind of parading around in their new clothing that Tilly's made for them, and we see the Beaumonts return from Melbourne. Now, in case you missed it, there's this kind of belittling and dismissive tone when they call the clothing that the Beaumonts are wearing Collins Street fashions. So that's not supposed to be taken seriously, and it's meant to be kind of contrasted with the European fashions that the rest of the town are wearing. Okay, now when Gertrude and Elizabeth walk back into the Pratt store, um, we see that they're dressed in these big Dior dresses made of, you know, taffeta, and they're these big domed um, dresses. So taffeta is this kind of very gaudy, shiny fabric, um, and the fact that it's so kind of large and showy, it really highlights that they don't fit in among the quote-unquote dingy shelves in their Dior skirts. So they quite literally don't fit in because their hems are brushing up against, you know, the um, nugget boot polish tins and the white, the shoe white bottles in the store, so they literally, like, don't fit between the shelves. Um, now, we can compare what they're wearing to the sapphire grey tunic that Muriel is wearing. So, once again, we see that Rosalie Hem really likes to play with materials and, like, fabrics in her writing. So, sapphire, historically, has been quite an expensive stone, and it kind of represents regality, so we see a bit of a contrast there, where one is very overtly showy, while the other one has like a quiet confidence, uh, like a quiet confidence, yeah, I would say that about what she's wearing. But the fact that Gertrude no longer fits, literally, and the fact that she's wearing this big showy dress kind of suggests that Gertrude is no longer one of the Pratts. And we see that as well through a lot of other kind of references to her, what she's wearing, and the way that language is used to describe her. So, we see that she no longer belongs, because she calls Muriel mother, she says hello mother, um, and despite the fact that she now calls Muriel mother, we still see this kind of edge of being unrefined in that there's a vocative comma missing there when she says hello mother. Um, we see this kind of affected speech, she says wonderful, um, and that's supposed to mirror the way that Elizabeth says marvellous. Um, and she says, oh, where is father? Where's father? Um, and Muriel says to her, if you call, hey, dad, he'll still answer. So we see that she's not used to calling her mum mother and her dad father. Now, I should have actually put mams in italics, but I didn't because... Um, it is night, and it is night time, and I am very tired. I'm kind of like a little old lady stuck in a young person's body, like I need to go to bed at night time. It just doesn't work. My brain just doesn't work at night time. I need to, you know, get up early and do things. Um, but anyway, Mams is supposed to be in italics, so it's this sarcastic thing that Reginald says when he says, oh, you know, he'll come as per your command. Um, and yet we see that Elspeth actually thanks him graciously for reporting that to her, um, as if, as if she kind of hasn't picked up on what he's doing there and she hasn't picked up on the sarcasm. Um, so once again, we see that kind of little touch of, uh, almost stupidity, you could say. It almost seems as if Rosalie Ham intentionally wants to depict her as if she's stupid. But Dungata. Um, we see that they say it like Doongata, again that should be in italics. Um, so we see this a little bit later, um, when she gives out the invitations to the Progressive Women's Club or Association. Um, because it's almost as if 
she feels like she's too good for the town. She has to change the town to fit her level of refinement as opposed to um, just accepting the town for what it is. Now we see Alvin Pratt walk out with his hello, hello, hello in his best grocer's voice. So this tells us straight away that there's kind of something a little bit wrong here. He kind of um, sees this as a business transaction because we know that in his personal life he's absolutely terrible and not at all warm, but he has this facade of warmness or warmth, um, I should say, when he, you know, speaks to people who he's conducting business with. But we also see that Gertrude, despite how ridiculous she now is and seems, she calls him daddy and before she called him father. So the difference here in what's happening between before and now is that now she's directly addressing him and she has something that she wants from him. So we see that Gertrude almost takes after her father a little um, in that she's quite shrewd in that way and she knows when she has to seem pleasant and when she can get away with, you know, being cold. Um, and we also see that she's called Trudy here by Elsbeth and the narrator. So Trudy, what as we said before, is kind of a demonstration of how much she's changed. So her her original family, the Pratts, they call her a, they called her Gert, but now that she's a Beaumont, they call her Trudy. So it's like these two completely separate people almost. Now we see that Gertrude here has kind of adopted a new position or role. Um, and with that, she's almost changed her personality entirely. So the dressmaker suggests that our personalities and our actions are shaped by our roles or the positions that we hold. So Gertrude has this progression here of becoming more and more pretentious, while Muriel kind of has the opposite arc, where she starts off, you know, living in, I believe it was Paran, and she moves away from that because she wants to get away from that pretentiousness. But in saying that our personalities and our actions are shaped by the roles or positions that we hold or those that are imposed upon us, it suggests that Tilly, it, well, it doesn't suggest, but there's an implication where it's asking whether Tilly does what she does because people treat her like a murderess or she does what she does out of just this intrinsic desire for vengeance that everyone has but is especially strong in her. Now, the Crucible also kind of concurs or agrees that our actions are determined not by our morals, but by the roles that we're made to play. So if you look at the women's, sorry, not the women's, the girls' experiences of getting cold and fainting and accusing people, it's kind of um, imposed by the, and I, wish, I shouldn't say imposed, it's caused or brought on by the hysteria, the anxiety, the panic and the guilt at what they have to do in the court. And we also see it with the judges, but we'll get into them a little bit later in this video. So continuing on with chapter 15, we see Elizabeth, you know, saying thank you graciously um, to uh, Reginald Blood. So I said gratefully here, it should actually say graciously. Okay, um, so Gertrude also says at home at Windswept Crest. So, crest. so once again, um, we see that she doesn't quite belong with the Pratts anymore. So what's really ironic here is that they call on the progressive-minded ladies of Dungatar. So once again, we see that Dungatar, the spelling of it has changed because they think they're too good for the town and they want the town to change for them. Um, but it's also ironic because they're probably some of the least progressive people in the town. Now, obviously, we're looking at this from a modern lens when this is set in the 50s. But if you look at some of the other characters who are, you know, comparatively or relatively more progressive than the women who were invited, um, especially considering that Tilly was not invited, it, you know, the irony is highlighted there. Um, so Mr. Pratt calls... Elsbeth and Gertrude, Mrs. Beaumonts. So he really went there with that, and he refused to cover the costs of uh, their shopping spree in Melbourne. So it kind of suggests almost that he's cut ties with his daughter. So he hasn't really cut ties, but it's uh, it, it's representative of the kind of relationship that they have and had in the past. So we saw that he was um, not the best father even before she got married. But now that she's married off, um, he he refers to her marriage as being unloaded. So for him, she was a burden all along. 
as a result of that kind of method of thinking, it almost seems as if he's glad to be rid of her and he wants to kind of cut her off entirely because he doesn't really want that much to do with her. Um, and that's why we see here um, that he doesn't want to cover the costs of what she bought. Okay, so in chapter 15 we also see Hamish and Septimus having this kind of argument in the in the bar. So in chapter 15 we also see this argument between Hamish and Septimus in the bar. So Septimus says that we had to build walls to stave off hungry Neoliths on page 139. So Neo means new and Liths means stones in Greek, probably Greek because I know it's definitely not Latin based on my, you know, somewhat rudimentary knowledge of Latin. Um, but Hamish re kind of replies that you have to have wheels for transport because he likes steam trains. Steam trains have wheels and th so he supports them. Um, and he refuses to budge that diesel is better when Septimus kind of replies that it is. And the fact that they bring up diesel trains kind of highlights the irony of this exchange because it suggests that the two of them can only really reason in a way that suits their worldview or is convenient to them. Um, and both men are trapped in the past to different extents on different topics. So what's ironically true, but not actually true in their specific case, is when Septimus says, in this town a man can cover his neighbor's wife and not get hurt, but to speak the truth can earn a bleeding nose. So he's saying you're punished for speaking the truth when people in private do all of these unsavory things. And that's very true about this town of Dungata, but it doesn't necessarily apply to them because were they telling the truth? Well, it's a matter of opinion. Some people believe that the earth is flat and some people believe that steam trains are better than diesel trains. Some people believe that the invention of the wheel was, you know, the downfall of humanity and it was all kind of downhill from there. And some people think that that's not the case. So obviously all of their ideas are very unreasonable, impractical, um, but at the end of the day, they are opinions. So you can't say, oh, it's not true. Um, but you can say that their opinions are unreasonable. Now, this kind of leads into this kind of area that you can um, compare the two texts in, and that's how science and reason are applied and how that ties in with convenience and passion. Now, here when I say passion, I don't mean, oh, like passionate lovemaking or, um, you know, a passion for a certain hobby. Here, passion means desire. What your goals are, what you want to do. So David Hume is this philosopher who kind of wrote a lot of the seminal works on scientific reasoning and he kind of um, asserted that reason is and ought only be the, uh, the slave to the passions. So what he's saying is that when we reason and when we think and use our cognitive faculties to evaluate information. We do so in a way that suits us and what we want to do. So Septimus and Hamish kind of really demonstrate this in that um, it's kind of convenient what they believe and what they kind of um, hold to be true. It's convenient um, in terms of how it fits in with their worldview and their schema of how the world works. So it's not quite the same as confirmation bias, but it's quite clear. Now in the Crucible, once again I should have italicized the Crucible, um, but the judges came to Salem to find witches and they approached the, the town with that in mind and it comes back to their role. So their role is to find witches and as such their reasoning happens in a way that's convenient to their reason for being there. Obviously, Hale is an exception to that, um, and we see that he almost kind of embodies the emerging principles of enlightened science. Um, there's a lot to unpack there when you talk about, you know, the emerging principles of enlightened science, because he um, subjects his ideas to kind of rigorous uh, scrutiny, you could call it that, before he makes a decision where the other judges don't. And he doesn't actively go out looking for witches at every turn. For example, when Giles Corey kind of implicates his wife Martha Corey in witchcraft, he says, you know, it's certainly interesting, but I wouldn't say that it's witchcraft. He almost has this reluctance to suggest that witchcraft is happening. And that's kind of 
reflective in the way that people conduct science now, where we're looking to either confirm or uh, not confirm, where we're looking to corroborate or reject the null hypothesis as opposed to the experimental hypothesis. Um, but that's a discussion for a completely different subject. Uh, I could talk about this forever because I took several many semesters of epistemology and the philosophy of science, but you know, um, that's not relevant here. Basically, Hale is an exception. So, um, back to chapter 15. We see that Faith O'Brien was, you know, rehearsing with Reginald, hence why she was not present. So, she, this kind of, this sentence here, she was rehearsing with Reginald, didn't need this comma, so why is it there? It's an illusion that they're, you know, doing the dirty, they're Netflixing and chilling, um, because it almost seems as if with Reginald holds particular significance because it's given its own clause. Now that's a really interesting and clever use of language, and that's the kind of thing that you really want to look for here, because it suggests, well, it doesn't suggest, it is an example of um, essentially how the text is constructed with language to create meaning, and that's really what this area of the study design is all about. So, we also see that the women acquired an accent overnight, so that ties in again with the new roles that they're given and how they fit into those new roles. And we're also introduced to Leslie Munkin. So, Leslie Munkin is kind of a bit of a grey area in terms of my personal opinions on the novel, so I think it's quite distasteful to go on a witch hunt as to who is homosexual, but um, he, it's very strongly alluded to that he is um, a, a gay man, and he, um, and he marries he marries Mona kind of for the respectability of it. Um, and we we see this when it says that he sat prettily, uh, knees across the knees crossed in the kitchen. So um, traditionally the kitchen, especially in the 1950s, was considered the woman's domain. Um, and when he, when it says he sat prettily, there's supposed to be an R there. Um, I just make typos sometimes. Or I can blame it on autocorrect, either one. But anyway, sat prettily, knees crossed in the kitchen, you know, knees crossed, and he calls Mona from the very beginning, my dear. Um, now, this next bit kind of re requires some degree of historical context, when he says that he raised the back of his hand to his forehead. So that's kind of like a fainting uh, position, almost, stereotypically, anyway. Now, this is a throwback to the early 20th century where women would constantly faint in fits of hysteria um, and the reason wasn't actually because they were you know the weaker sex as a lot of scientists of the time proposed it was actually because they were corseted so tight that it restricted their blood flow and as a result they would faint whenever they you know emotionally got kind of overstimulated. Now I want to highlight though that there is a reason why um, why Rosalie Hamm never explicitly states that he's homosexual, and instead she needs to strongly allude to it in this way. And that's because it reflects the reality of what life was like for homosexual people back then. Um, you know, their, their identities were not validated by the law, and they were essentially illegal. Um, so as a result, here she's kind of reflecting that in the strong illusions as to, as opposed to the direct, um, the direct method of stating it overtly. Um, Leslie Munkin says, that's what your mother wants and we can't let the boss down, can we? So there's a double meaning here because Elizabeth doesn't just want Mona to learn to ride a horse, she also wants Mona married off and she gets exactly that, but obviously Leslie doesn't know it yet. So, um, we also see this kind of uh, almost allusion to where Gertrude sits in the family totem pole in, within the Beaumont family when they look down upon Trudy with love and overwhelming gratitude.
So they love her because she's, you know, pregnant with William's child and they're grateful to her for, you know, carrying on the Beaumont name. But the words looked down upon here really highlight where she sits with them. Um, she's not valued, she's seen as lesser than, and as soon as she gives birth to a child, there's this implication that she will no longer be worth much to them at all. So we also see the dynamic between Mona and Elspeth change, because it's almost as if Elspeth always needs somebody to hate. She's never just happy with life, she's never just content. So that shifts from William to Gertrude, and now to Mona. So that object of her hatred becomes Mona. Um, and that's something that we almost see a little bit with the Crucible too, because the situation calls for somebody to be blamed for witchcraft, and so the girls of the town of Salem essentially throw everybody else under the bus. They deflect blame in that way. Now, Mona is kind of portrayed as a child having a tantrum here um, when she talks about the child you know, taking her room and they're going to make it a nursery and whatnot. And that's because Mona is meant to be portrayed as a child. She's seen as this kind of wanton, spoiled child throughout the text. So that's the end of chapter 15. Um, so I hope you guys learned something. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time.